This episode of the After Action Review Podcast is brought to you by Seabag Locker Coffee. Look, gimmicks are gimmicky. Flashy videos, guns, and trucks have nothing to do with good quality coffee. Seabag Locker is all about quality. They care about what goes in your cup and how you start your day. From roast to your cup in as little as four days, that's what coffee's all about. Go to SeabagLockerCoffee.com, use promo code AAR, get 10% off your purchase. Buy quality, not gimmicks. SeabagLockerCoffee.com, use promo code AAR, get 10% off your purchase. We're also brought to you by the Java Can, an all-in-one ruggedized coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so that you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere from your backyard to a mountaintop in Afghanistan. The Java Can will brew you and your team a fresh cup of coffee no matter where life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, get your 10% off. Live life charged. And now, the After Action Review with Rod Rodriguez. And welcome to the After Action Review. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez, and this is episode 50. Huge milestone for me, for us. Episode one was published back in 2016. I started the show with a microphone I bought from a crackhead on Craigslist in Killeen, Texas. Turns out he rapped like garbage and needed the money, so I brought home a used Yeti and I got right to work. My first recording was done at my kitchen table and it was an intro to the podcast and really it was about me explaining to me what I wanted to do with this show, what I wanted to do with the podcast. Now, this show has gone through a lot of changes. I've learned a lot about audio, editing, and the different ways to make a show. I even came close to quitting the podcast entirely when I was overseas in Afghanistan trying to figure out how I was going to make all of this work with a 12-hour schedule, seven days a week. There was a hiatus of about two months, uh, but honestly, it was it was my friend's and my family, shout out to uh, Devon, uh, that dude kept me going. Uh, you know, it was his encouragement, honestly, in Afghanistan that, uh, man, I, you know, I don't think I would be here doing this show right now had he not encouraged me to keep going, to keep doing what I thought was important. So thanks, Devon. Much appreciated, man. Now, I've kept this show going uh, I kept the show going from all over the country, uh, Arizona, Texas, California, uh, and I've kept the show going from Kuwait, Afghanistan, and Dubai. The After Action Review means the world to me because of what it represents. Lessons from people who've walked the road of entrepreneurship. There is no lip service here, none. These people, these entrepreneurs, these warriors, they've all made mistakes that they can learn from, that you can learn from. But they've also accomplished a lot that we need to learn from in turn. That's the whole point of the show, to learn, to support each other as veteran entrepreneurs and to have a space where we can share our stories. Now, I get it. This isn't a wacky show. Um, this isn't over-the-top comedy. There are no bikini-clad women or booze being served here, although we've had a couple of interviews with booze. But the point is, the point is, I get it. This is a business show, and it's not always the hotness compared to a lot of veteran shows that are shooting stuff and having fun and I don't go out of my way to make flashy graphics and and you know I, I want to try and keep the show real and here's the thing we all talk about supporting veterans we all talk about veteran owned businesses but the truth is too many of us aren't buying veteran business products we're just not either we don't think of them when we're making our purchases or we just don't know about them that's why I encourage you to like, listen, subscribe, and share this podcast. The more people that hear about the show, the more people will know where to buy their vet-owned products. Just yesterday, a civilian with no military affiliation reached out to me on Instagram to say that he enjoys listening to the show. The message is getting out there and veteran stories, they are inspiring others to make their own moves. And that is amazing. Now, our social media 
is valued by sponsors and customers alike. Go to your vet-owned business and like their social media post. Now, I, I know you're thinking, you know, that doesn't make sense. What 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 does liking do? Well, this looks great for potential customers who might look at how well known a business is, and from that they extract value. You might think that's a poor way to determine how good something is, but the truth is, a lot of us do it. We do exactly that every day. So that like, that share, that follow, it has value, folks. It has real value. Customers will go see, oh, uh, they have 50,000 subscribers. They have 50,000 followers. This post has been shared 30 times. It's got to be quality. That is where our brain goes. That's the consumer mindset. So the social media likes, shares, and follows. Yeah, that doesn't translate to a direct sale, but it can direct. It can uh, lead to an indirect sale in the sense that people come to the website as they see it build or as they see the social media following grow, they become more and more interested, and that leads to a purchase. Now, I would be ecstatic to have the kind of numbers that podcasts that do nothing for veteran businesses have. I would love to see a million subscribers. Who doesn't want Joe Rogan numbers? Now, I know we can get there, but it takes time and patience. And here I am. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to rest till we have that kind of critical mass in terms of veteran entrepreneurship. And what's going to help me get there along the way is going to be Alpha Brain from Onnit, clinically proven to help focus memory and concentration, all natural, no stimulants. Go to onnit.com, use coupon code AAR to check out, and you're going to save yourself 10% off your purchase. Make Alpha Brain and Onnit your unfair advantage over the competition. Coupon code AAR, get 10% off. Your business is worth it. Go to onnit.com. Like how I slipped that in there. I'm also drinking my. Uh, See bag locker coffee, same thing, AAR, 10% off, boom. Now, I promised you all a special guest for this episode. All my guests are amazing, first of all, but this, this veteran is easily one of the hardest working guys in the United States Army. He's a professional MMA fighter, winner of the Ultimate Fighter 16. I know some of you have already figuring, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And an active duty sergeant first class, my guest is none other than Colton Smith. This was our second attempt at doing an interview, as you'll hear later. Uh, The background noise you'll be hearing also is because we recorded this episode in a Marine Corps physical rehab clinic located in the dungeon of the Quantico Gym, where Colton teaches jujitsu. It was the only place we could find that was relatively quiet to do this interview. And uh, we just finished doing some jujitsu, so... Uh, I was exhausted. I was beat up. He was fresh as a daisy. He, he looked like he could have gone uh, 20 more rounds with any one of us. But you know what? I would have recorded this in a wind tunnel. I don't care. This interview is worth it. Wait, it was worth it. And I think you're going to find that Colton is more than just MMA and business. He's more than Enlist at Nine. He's also about values, which I think you're going to see. That's going to come out as the interview goes on. So... Without further ado, let's jump into this. Episode 50, the After Action Review with Colton Smith. Um, For the five people who don't know who you are, uh, give us a brief rundown on who Colton Smith is. So I'm an active duty sergeant first class. I work at the Pentagon for the senior listed advisor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a pro fighter as well. Uh, Ultimate Fighter Season 16 winner while on active duty. Only one to hold that the recognition of being an active duty service member and fighting the UFC simultaneously. And uh, for anybody that's listening, uh, I did not receive any preferential treatment, which a lot of people assume that right off the get-go, that I, how could you fight in the UFC, be at active duty? Um, I've held every leadership position in the infantry from uh, you know a, a 240 gunner to fire team leader all the way up to platoon sergeant, and, and I've served a little first sergeant time, but... Now I'm working for the SEAC, the Senior Listed Advisor, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He's the top NCO leader in the whole armed forces. A lot of people don't even know the position exists because there's only been three of them. He is the third one. And so I travel the world with him. Any, any given uh, month, we're, we're gone. We're visiting troops, and uh, I'm supporting him while he gains the pulse of the force for the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, as well as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, General Joe Dumford. So 
Uh, I'm blessed. I have a lovely wife, Megan, who who really runs the company, Enlisted Nine Fight Company, our, our business, um, along with uh, Command Sergeant Major Retired Dan O'Brien. He's our business partner in the venture, and that's been an amazing uh, feat in itself, uh, how much we've grown that. So that's who I am, uh, father, husband, Christian, entrepreneur, fighter, and, uh, and leader. So we originally recorded uh, several, almost a, almost a year and a half ago, um, in Afghanistan, where I met you again. So it's so funny. We go back some time. Your son and uh, yourself, you both trained at Twin Wolves Mixed Martial Arts in, um, what is the name of the town? Uh, Harker Heights, which is where I, I started my jujitsu path. Um, and then we met up again in Bagram, where you were teaching jujitsu. Uh, I was able to pull you in. Uh, again, I had to hunt you down again. One of the busiest people on Bagram at the time you were uh, green suitor. And I think I, I think that's important to note that you weren't there teaching jujitsu. You weren't there. Te- you weren't there as a celebrity uh, army guy like, oh, you know, like freak show. Come meet Colton Smith, get your autograph. And, <laughs> you know, uh, you were there working. I mean, I believe you were in charge of security at the time or, or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, a, I was a, a platoon sergeant for a rifle infantry company uh, supporting a, a joint task force over there doing uh, different missions and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was busy, busy times, but I, but I had to get it in. I mean, for me, jujitsu and the ability to roll, I mean, just the resiliency aspect of it um, to kind of decompress. And what was great is the, my ability to impart that on, on the, the, the company of infantry soldiers that we had, you know, because our mission – our mission was difficult. We were very undermanned um, and uh, overtasked, most likely, is a, is a good way to put it. But, uh, you know, being able to impart, uh, I guess, a, a tool that I utilize for resiliency, which is jujitsu, on them, I think it's everlasting for them. And most of them have, uh, have stuck with it or reached out to me and, and explained how, how important that was for them, for their resiliency to be able to continue the mission uh, when, when, you know, heavy cards were dealt. Now, at the time when we did our first interview, we talked very briefly about uh, an upcoming fight you had. Uh, you were going to be fighting for uh, the, I believe, the championship, the championship belt, uh, World Series of Fighting at the time, or did it change? Yeah, so um, leading into that deployment, I was on a four-fight win streak, um, and I was doing doing good things, you know, opted to deploy. I didn't have to deploy. I, I, I found a unit on Fort Hood that was deploying. They needed uh, infantry, rifle, platoon sergeants, uh, and, you know, so... Me being who I am, I really wanted to deploy and lead soldiers in in, uh, in combat, you know. So so I uh, uh, lived lived the Ranger Creed and went and took my platoon, um, and I literally fought two weeks before getting on the plane, and I won four fights in a row. And I was signed with World Series of Fighting at the time, and unfortunately, World Series of Fighting went through some serious changes during that deployment, mm-hmm. and they uh, they reflagged to Pro Fighters League, and uh, they did reach out to me. Ray Sefo, the the CEO, reached out to me, asked if you know I still was on board. And uh, I think we, we just had two separate visions of uh, where I was going, where they were going. And uh, so it was an amicable, amicable split. And uh, luckily, I got out of my contract with that. So now I'm just training, trying to trying to find a good time to fight, uh, which, again, I've never trained full time for fighting. However, I'm 30 years old. I'm coming into my prime. I feel that uh, I'm in some of the best shape I've ever been in physically as an athlete, mentally. And uh I enjoy coaching a lot, so I really need to try to figure out how I can have that happy balance of being a father, a husband, entrepreneur, a soldier leader, uh, as well as a coach and a fighter. So there's 1,440 minutes in a day, and somehow I need to pack in about 1,800 minutes into that 1,440 minutes, so I'm trying to figure that out now. And once I figure that out, hopefully I get back in the cage. There's a lot of mixed martial arts commentators, uh, uh, athlete or athletic uh, experts who would argue that to be the top of your game in any sport, any endeavor, you have to commit 100% to it. You are diverting a lot of your attention in a lot of different directions, entrepreneurship. Uh, the, the army is more than a nine to five job. That's, that's a 12 to 18 hour a day job, depending on what you're doing at a time, plus the deployments. How do you maintain the the level of commitment that it takes to step into a ring to step into a cage against somebody who wants to uh beat you half to death and still perform at that level despite all these other and i don't want to see the army as a distraction because that's that is that i don't think that's a good way to describe it but it certainly presents um a distraction from 
what other athletes are doing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I think that's, that's what I really uh, enjoy. And I, I kind of tip my cap uh, is, is my ability to be an active duty service member um, and kind of have this extracurricular, which is being a professional athlete, which is which kind of weird to call it extracurricular. And yes, conventional wisdom would say, Colton, you won the ultimate fighter. You defied odds doing that. You only had four or five pro fights at the time. Everyone else had about 20, 25 in the house. You beat everybody because you were able to focus for the first time in your life on fighting in the house, which I took personal leave for, by the way, just a caveat off that. But uh, that's just a little, a little joke. But no, um, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of why I do it. Um, I, I love being a leader. I love being in the military. And a lot of people called for me to get out after one ultimate fighter. I mean, even even general officer, um, I'm not going to say his name on air, but it, he was even like, so we're going to lose you, huh? I said, no, sir, I'm, I'm re-enlisting, you know, uh, when I was in three Corps. And so I re-enlisted, stayed in the service, and I re-enlisted again, you know, and stayed in the service. And, and yes, conventional wisdom would say, you know, you should just chase chase your dreams full time as a fighter. Because yes, my, my heart my heart definitely uh, beats for, for MMA and to be a world champion one day. Um, and yes, uh, like my last fight, I, I underperformed uh, grossly. Um, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah, I underperformed grossly my last fight, unfortunately. And you know, I put in a lot of lot of time and effort every waking moment I had that I wasn't training or or doing stuff for the business or with the family. I was very selfish in my preparation uh, as far as preparing properly. And I just straight up, you know, hadn't been in the cage for two and a half years almost two and a half years and just fought flat. You know, again, my opponent was extremely, diff- extremely tough, undefeated guy, however, not unbeatable. I mean, I, I, I believe that uh, any given day I can, I can contend with anybody in, in the world. And if you don't believe that and you're a fighter, you need to get the hell out of the cage and find mm-hmm. a new profession. You know, you got to believe that there has to be a level uh, in the ultimate fighter. I mean, on paper, I was probably out of 32. I was ranked number 31 or 32, to be honest with you. Uh, but my, my belief in myself, my belief in, in what I bring to the table and the fact that I sacrificed so much, uh, you know, in the military and away from training, I felt like that gave me the edge in some weird, sick way that that gave me an edge was, was me not being able to train, gave me an edge because I made the best case scenario for my situation. That's what I just want to tell everyone. I'm not trying to gloat. I'm not trying to, to be on a high horse here, but no matter what your situation is, I don't care if you have a 24 hour fitness and a punching bag and some Gracie DVDs or something, make the best case scenario for yourself. When you step in that cage, when you step on the playing field, whatever sport you play, whatever you do, whatever you know your heart beats for, whatever your, what I call your God birth dream is, it doesn't matter uh, what your opponent's doing. It doesn't matter what you see the, the, the pros, the guys at the top doing. I, I mean, I get it, you wanna emulate certain people, but if you, the cards you've been dealt at that time aren't gonna allow for that, Make the best case scenario for yourself, and I believe that that's what I've done throughout my career and my in the army career as well as fighting career. And I have a lot of haters for it in the in mixed martial arts community. You know, people people hate on me quite a bit, which is totally fine. And, you know, God bless them. In the army, even I'll admit it, I'm an active duty service member, but there's a lot of higher ups in the military that that um, do not agree with the army allowing me to fight. But again, they they might be under preconceived notions that I that I get pre, uh, you know uh, preferential treatment, which which has never never occurred, never happened. So. Um, yeah, that's me. That's my testimony. That's how I feel about, you know, no matter what drives you, whatever burning desire you have in your heart, your God birth dream, I feel like you just need to chase it. You need to go after it every right. waking moment, uh, believe in it and find people that are going to surround you and not give you, feed you with BS saying, you know, oh, you're going to make it. You're awesome. You know, if that's not the truth, they need to be honest with you. And I've had people that have given me, you know, some, some truth throughout the years. Unlike a lot of other sports where you have teams, you have other, um, you have other, uh, uh individuals that are part of the the game they're on the field with you uh teammates mma boxing these combat sports are you against one other person you were coming off of four win fight streak uh uh, yeah a four win fight streak uh you were at the top of your game it seemed for a hot bit like you things were just going your way and you earned it you go in the ring you suffer this defeat how do you handle that moment when it feels like maybe the tides have turned or you hit that mark? A lot of people don't stand back up. It'd be tempting to be like, you know what? This is enough. I have the army. I have this. I've you know, enlisted nine. I got all these other things. What am I doing? Why am I stepping in this cage anymore? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny. Uh, I remember a moment during the fight because, I mean, I literally left the cage completely unscathed. I mean, I've had fights where I've been so lopsided and that I won. And I mean, I just destroyed the guy for, 
you know, 14 minutes and 59 seconds. And somehow I left the cage with stitches and, you know, a, a, a tweaked up shin and ankle. And, you know, next day I feel like I got hit by a semi truck. This fight, I lost by decision and I didn't have a single scrape, scratch, nothing on me, you know, which was insane. The guy that I fought was a very formidable opponent built. I mean, the guy was just, just like a, uh, he was like a, a semi truck, but um, unfortunately, I just underperformed. I didn't take any risks. You know, I was I was extremely risk adverse, which is not, you know, usually I'll meet someone in the, in the middle of the cage, take them down, grind them, and look for the finish. And if they, you know, any other other fight that I've lost previously, I mean, I go at I go at it. You know, right. get, go for the go for the finish, mm -hmm. and either get finished or, or have a bloody fight like I used to have back in the day. You know, have to stand in the middle and just throw haymakers at each other. But this fight was different. And so yes, after the fight, I was like, holy crap, that have I lost it? You know, have I? You know, I'm luckily I had people around me like, hey, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, this stuff happens in the fight game. You know this. And it's happened before where I've underperformed, where I felt like, man, I was really flat out there, almost out of body experience. Was I warmed up enough? Was I was I mentally prepared physically? Yeah, I was I was definitely prepared. I felt great. I was light. Uh, I felt like I was going to go in there and and I could go, you know, 10 five minute rounds, which is, which is true. I stay in pretty good shape as far as that goes. But psychologically, for some reason, you know, I, I fought flat and it happens. There's a lot of times it's, uh, there's not really, there's not an excuse for it. I don't make an excuse. You know, my opponent was a better man that day. Uh, and you know, I, luckily I'm healthy. I was living training the other day. I mean, I was back in the gym the next week teaching my students here at Quantico, as well as my students, at the Pentagon, the war fighters that I teach. And I think that that's, that's one of the big things is, you know, the biggest thing when I step in the cage is worst case scenario, I'm going to wake up single leg and Herb Dean, you know, when, when I'm down range, worst case scenario, I'm going to die. You know, that, that's the worst case. Yeah. And, and it's kind of a stark reminder for me, the people that I teach, that I train, most of them are either veterans or they're active duty service members. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of Marines here down at Quantico, Navy personnel, uh, as well as the Army guys and some uh, FBI guys down here in Quantico as well and police officers. So in their profession, I mean, literally what I'm teaching them, I feel uh, I could teach a thousand people if one person comes back to me and says, dude, you saved my life or dude, you know, I was able to de-escalate de a situation that may have been me pulling my firearm out with all these cameras around me and, you know, getting on Facebook or something for shooting something because I didn't have the skills to properly do this. So kind of go off on a tangent here, but I just, it's just putting it in perspective. I lost in the cage. I lost a, a, a decision, poor lackluster performance on my end. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I think there's a lot more important things that I do in life. Uh, again, I want to be a world champion. I want to keep keep training, keep fighting, keep competing every way I can, fight against human beings that are training full time for this stuff uh, and test my mettle against them. And I feel like more times than not, I'm obviously going to come out with my hand raised, which I've shown time and time again. Um, but at the end of the day, the important jobs that I hold, important duties, I think professional MMA fighter, is maybe the fourth or fifth one in, in line, to be honest with you. And that's not discrediting pro MMA fighters. They're, they're amazing athletes. And I, you know, hats off to them for anybody that steps in the cage. They have my respect. Uh, but as far as uh, if I had to put order precedence of what's important in my life, you know, fourth or fifth is what, what fighting is. Where would you put the Enlisted Nine Fight Company, which is your brand, which is your, your company, your label for... Um, athletic wear, t-shirts, the whole nine yards, where do you fit your company and your list of priorities? Yeah, so I think what's really important about the company is something I never really thought about. So when we partnered with Grunt Style a few years back and then we really started you know, blowing up Grunt Style, we uh, decided to partner with them. They're gonna help us with, with fulfillment and kind of how they do operate and do business and stuff. And, and uh, the CEO, Dan Alaric, really, really helped us, took us under his wing to assist with us with our company and, and grow us up. Um, something I didn't really realize was as we were growing, uh, more and more employees were going to be needed to be hired through Grunt Style to fulfill all of our orders and stuff like that. So as they grew, we grew. And for a long time, I was like, okay, there's only three of us. It's me, Dan, and my wife. You know, it's, and I'm, I, by the way, everybody that's listening, I'm, I'm like the guy in the, the corner that draws with the crayons, eats a crown sometimes. And, and my wife and Dan are the ones that are the masterminds. So I'm not taking the credit for, for everything that happens in a list of nine. Um, but I look and see, and you know, and I got to thinking about it. Wait, we've we've hired on, you know, however many people to help fulfill and customer service and artists and everything else that Grunt Styles had to hire as well uh, to to build the company up. So the amount of people that that we touch and affect, not only with with our our messaging on our clothing, um, we don't talk about it a whole lot. But the uh, I guess the stuff we've done for nonprofits and for charities and for individual families and what we've been able to reach and and help and assist uh, behind closed doors. 
that is why Enlisted Nine is so important to me. It's not about the bottom line. It's not about us making a buck. It honestly isn't, and it never has been. The second Fort Hood shooting happened, and uh, we, we found a way to make some shirts, sell them very quickly, and give the money to Fisher House, you know, stuff like that. And again, we're not, we don't try to publicize this. We don't make sponsored ads about, hey, look, we gave this money to this company or this company or this charity or this family that was in need because we don't, we don't want to monetize that. We don't. We truly want to give back to the community, give back to uh, the military members who support us and the patriots, American patriots who support us as well. So um, I'd say as far as Enlist in Nine goes, it, it, it's, it's, you know, probably as far as priorities go, you know, family, God, God, country, families first, no matter what. Service to my country second. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of goes in. And then third is definitely enlisted nine because of what we've been able to affect and, and who we've been able to affect and help uh, through this. Through this, I mean, it could end tomorrow. I couldn't be bad. It's been an amazing venture. Um, we've touched so many lives and, and we built an amazing company. And this is when we were both active duty and we had a military spouse, my wife, you know, raising my kids, taking them everywhere, all their uh, sporting events. And she was in like a plastic furniture. I mean, literally packaging shirts. She was everybody. She was the, she, she was the, f- f- the fulfiller, the packager, the, the shipper, the customer service. So all from the, you know, confines of our, of our small on post house. <laughs> I remember one of the, um, one of the CEOs I talked to, um, when I first got out of the army, my first job was with the, it was a contract company called the previous group. And I sat down with the CEO once we're just, you know, lunch chatting. And I asked him, what do you like the most about being the CEO? What, what is it about this? You know, being the, the, the guy at the top, do you, do you like the most? Is it the money, the, the little, the benefits that come with, you know, being the big guy. And he said, the thing I love the most is Christmas. I said, what do you mean? He says, I love knowing that this company that I steer, the company that I make the decisions for, the employees of this company are putting toys under their tree with the money they made from this endeavor. They're, they're putting food on their, on their table with money from this company. He said, this is what I enjoy the most is the, the knowledge that we are helping every single employee here make a living. I thought that was amazing. That's something that stuck with me, which is one of the reasons that I, you know, I, I really enjoyed this podcast because I get to talk to people in different positions within their company um, and hear what it is that you prioritize and to hear that come from you about how you prioritize the Enlisted Nine Fight Company um, that's, that's amazing. That's really good. I like to hear that. Tell me about, you know, what prompted you to go into this t-shirt business uh, at the time when you entered, um, I guess the veteran apparel market, it was still a burgeoning kind of, uh, a marketplace. It wasn't as flooded as it is today. I believe at the time you, and how old is the company? Like seven? Uh, so I won the ultimate fighter in 2012. So 2013 is kind of in a 2013 we kind of kind of started soft launch and then right. um and then we kind of kind of started getting bigger about after six that. years yeah about five six, six years, years. Yeah. yeah about five years serious and then about six years total so about five six years ago um grunt style was they were they were they were the they were the big player but there weren't too many other there was like um uh the nine line uh there were there were a couple but not like it is today no, where it seems like everybody has a t-shirt company or some type of veteran apparel um at the time it seemed like an open space what what about the veteran apparel marketplace attracted you so when i won the ultimate fighter got the contract and everything that, that entails i have a really good friend of mine tim kennedy i'm sure all the, all the listeners know who tim kennedy is so Tim kind of mentored me financially. Um, you know, fighting is a very lucrative sport for a very short amount of time at the top level. Now, I think when you're coming through the regional, you know, you're losing more money than you're making. Even in the UFC, there's guys that are losing more money than they're making because they, they got to train and feed their families and everything else. So I'm a guy that had a full-time job and was smart with finances beforehand and then gets, you know, a pretty large chunk of change after I won the Ultimate Fighter. And I wanted to find a way to monetize it, you know, and I, I, I really did. Um, and Tim was part of a t-shirt company at the time. And, and I knew that, you know, I kind of had inside information on that. Well, I knew this command sergeant major Dan O'Brien from, from, uh, jujitsu actually, we, 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 we did jujitsu, 
uh, in the same place in El Paso with DJ Blackwell, one of my first jiu-jitsu instructors at Helsin Gracie in El Paso back in the day when it was called that. And uh, so I knew Dan. I knew Dan was an artist for some t-shirt companies and stuff like that. And he approached me and said, hey, man, why don't we do a shirt? You know, we talked about it a little bit. And so I said, I don't know, man. And so, you know, we actually went and talked to a different company, a uh, company out of uh, South Texas. We went and visited them, drove like five hours. And unfortunately, that, that company, uh, they were kind of trying to pull the wool over our eyes, trying to get me to pay a bunch of money to get into the company. And they weren't really uh, tried and true yet. Unfortunately, it ended up being kind of kind of a shady business. So on the drive home, Dan and I were talking, you know, and he's like, I'm sorry about that, but I had to be honest with you about that company. You know, I felt like, I felt like they were trying to get you. And we started talking about doing a shirt. So I said, okay, why don't we invest a small amount of money, both of us, and if it doesn't work out, the shirt flops, then we'll just cut our losses there. And so that's what we did. We, we put in a, a small, small amount of money, made our first run of shirts. You know, I printed out of California. Dan did the artworks. He's an artist. And, and I talked to Megan about it. I said, hey, we're going to do this. You know, and she's like, what are you talking about? You know, you're going to you're a fighter, you're a soldier, you're a father, you're a husband. You know, do we have time to do this? And I said, well, so we were hoping that, that you know, you would, <laughs> you know, Dan is a command sergeant major at the time and, and a different command, obviously, weren't in the same, same area. But uh, so that's so when my wife kind of took over the company and, and started doing everything from, from, the, from, from our house, basically, and went from you know, a small area of the living room, the whole living room to a bedroom to two bedrooms to, to, you know, everywhere in my house had shirts floor to ceiling. And my wife was just, I mean, it was unbelievable how fast and efficient she was at getting people their shirts. And it, we, we've, we've had a thing about our company, I think, is we've had a phenomenal product from the beginning. We were a mediocre business people with a phenomenal product. Usually you'll find people that are phenomenal business people and phenomenal marketers and phenomenal snake oil salesman uh, with a mediocre product. We, we were the opposite. So we had a phenomenal product and, and we had no clue what we were doing business-wise for the most part. Um, however, my wife and no one taking a paycheck for the first couple of years, uh, although humbling and times frustrating, I believe that is what really set us over the edge. You see Shark Tank and you, you, you see the way that they talk to their the people that come in and stuff and, and uh, people thinking these big lavish salaries right off the rip and, and you know you hear Mark Cuban and a few other people in the Shark Tank talk about dude no you need to you know you need, you need to not take a paycheck you need to be eating uh, you know ketchup packets and mm -hmm. whatever else uh, and then chasing your dream so I think uh, that's what motivated us was the fact that we came from such humble beginnings and I think that's what really drove us to want to build this company and Tim you know gave me a way to, to monetize the, the small platform that I gained from the Ultimate Fighter, or modest platform, I guess you could call it, and and so we did that. And then the, the company grew far past, uh, I hate to say the talk like this, but Colton Smith, you know, it grew far past that. And our impact, I believe, on the veteran community is exponentially larger now because of what the company has became. So it sounds like Tim Kennedy was instrumental as a mentor, you know, bringing you into this idea of, you know, there's more you you have to capitalize on this fight game you have to use this money to 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 create your own revenue stream outside of the outside of the cage outside of everything else um you start the company uh and obviously you're a celebrity and you put yourself in that position of the spotlight and obviously uh it's great to have a celebrity somebody who who people know to back a company to, to wear the brand like you're wearing a shirt right now. Um, how did that feel to carry that responsibility, to carry the weight of this brand, the people that are behind it? Uh, this isn't just like a sponsorship. This is your company, your wife's work, uh, Tim's uh, guidance. Uh, you've got your friend's artwork. All this is riding on your shoulders. This, this seems like it could be um, pretty stressful. Yeah, with everything else that was compounding, you know, uh, all the other hats that I wear per se uh, in life and in and, and, and business, profession and, and fighting as a soldier, as a leader and people that depend on me. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was it was uh, utilizing my platform. And if it didn't work, you know, what's that going to do to me? What's that going to do for my, I guess, my marketability in any any realm or any aspect of. of but luckily, you know, Dan O'Brien and, and my wife they picked up everything, you know, when I was training for fights, I would be selfish doing that. And they, they, you know, when I wasn't leading soldiers and stuff and, and they would pick up the slack. So, uh, I think 
even to this day, it's pretty wild. You know, we have half a million people on Facebook, um, you know, which is a big deal, big, big marketing for us. We use Google and Instagram and all kinds of different marketing techniques and stuff. But it's even if we get one email or one comment on any kind of sponsored ad or anything and, and someone says, hey, I haven't got my shirt yet. I mean, I'll personally, I'll be the guy literally, you know, and so will my wife, so will, so will Dan. Um, I'll be the first one. I'll double click on there and I'll get their name and I'll, I'll direct message them and say, hey, what's up with your order? What's your, give me your order number. Give me your name. You know, I'm always the guy that wants to give them a free shirt. Like, Hey, I'll, I'll make this right. Cause I don't want to, you know, I want people to wear our stuff. I want it to wear it proudly. I want them to know that we truly put our heart and soul into every product we give anybody, any product we, we sell anybody. And when they buy a product, they have that guarantee that no matter what, if uh, the product's not to their liking, we're going to replace it. We're going to make it right. And, and that's still to this day. I mean, we literally, I mean, today, I think I saw a Facebook ad, uh, before I, before I came to practice actually. And I saw somebody comment on there like, I haven't got my shirt. I ordered it a couple weeks ago, you know? And, and so you, you know, get down to the business and find out why that single person. But I mean, to me, that's so important. I don't want to lose anybody. It, it, I, my, my heart literally will start racing. I'm like, Oh man, you know, this person is a, maybe a loyal customer or someone that obviously I don't know all the names anymore. We had loyal customers at one time where I, we knew all of them. We knew exactly who was going to buy shirts. We knew their addresses. My wife could literally write them down. Dan knew, Hey, John, you know, from, Denver, he, he, he needs a shirt. Okay, Roger, we'll get it shipped out to him, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's what separates us. Each and every person that's on that Facebook, each and every person that's on that Twitter, the Instagram, every person that, 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 that surfs our Google or, or orders anything from us or just emails us, asks us what our company's about. It just fuels us. We love it. It's not, it's not about the money either. I can't, it's so hard to explain. It's not about the money. It's not about, you know, how, how how fast we've grown and, and what we've done. And, you know, I think it's about the journey more than anything. And I think that I could, I think at this point, knowing nothing about the clothing industry, I truly believe that the group that I'm surrounded by right now, Dan Alarak with, you know, Tim Kennedy always, always mentoring me, telling me I'm an idiot or, uh, to fix things in my life or sell my Mustangs. I'm stupid and I need to get a, a fuel efficient vehicle and, <laughs> you know, or Dan O'Brien or, or my wife. I feel like we could take over any industry and be successful because our hearts are hundred percent invested for the right reasons. And, you know, my faith, I'm very faith driven. So my belief in God, I, I believe that he puts all these dreams in our hearts for a reason. And that this is, this is me. I'm not trying to push my, my faith in anybody. However, I got to tell you, I mean, I would not be here today if it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I feel like I'm able to wear all these different hats and do all these different things and still strive for greatness in every aspect of my life because of my God, because of Jesus. And then that's just bottom line. We're living in a day right now of social media. We got guys like Gary Vaynerchuk out there uh, encouraging entrepreneurs to not just push their product, not to just uh, promote their product, but to promote themselves, to be the brand. Uh, Colton Smith is in many ways a brand, but he's also a person. How do you handle being both? And not only being Colton Smith, the brand, being Colton Smith, the professional, which you've already, you, you, you've kind of alluded to, you've touched on it. There's a lot of hate out there for you. Um, there are assumptions being made about your treatment, which, uh, are not true, but you still have to carry that. How do you, how do you work around Colton Smith, the brand versus Colton Smith, the army sergeant, the army NCO? Yeah. So obviously I have to be very careful because I am a, a senior non-commissioned officer, 24, seven, 365. And, and I, and I believe that I, you know, I, I believe I carry myself with that. Uh, early on, you know, the haters, people coming at you, you know, left and right on Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that, or even in person, you know, yeah, I'd get all fired up and I'd want to defend myself and stuff like that. And family members want to defend them and friends want to defend defend me and stuff like that. Then it got to the point where I was like, this is this is a losing battle. You know, you're not going to win this battle against the trolls online. Uh, so then I got to the point where I was like, all right, thank, you know, people would literally be like, you know, I hope you F and die. <laughs> you know, you're the worst human being ever, you know, you're, you're, hor you're, you're horrible for the army, blah, 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 you know? And I'd say, all right, thank you very much. God bless. And it's funny because as soon as I start saying that, I wasn't being condescending. I was like, you know, whatever you're entitled to your opinion is what I meant, you know, and God bless you. Cause you know, hopefully God blesses everybody. And they, they'd write back like, well, you know, I just think this because of this and this, but you know, you seem like an all right guy. So it's crazy how that flipped from me. If I would have defended myself, like, oh yeah, well I think, you know, whatever. 
you know, come after them, be like a schoolyard bully or something. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's been difficult to navigate, especially when you know somebody that doesn't dislikes you in the military because of, I guess, what uh, fame you've had or what kind of treatment they believe you've had. That's kind of more difficult, I think, than than uh, than a, a you know, no offense to civilians at all by any means. But when I one of my own, one of my own that I could possibly uh, you know shed blood, sweat, and tears with downrange dislikes me because of maybe the success or fame that I've enjoyed or what they, they believe maybe I've been treated like or, or given in life. Um, that, that hurts me a little more. And that actually gives me a little, a little effect on me and makes me want to explain myself to that individual, explain to them, you know, why I'm on this journey. I'm on this journey for them as well, you know, to represent them hopefully the best way I can possibly. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm not a choir boy. You know, I've, 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 I've been in trouble, done stupid things throughout my life, but I feel like I try to represent the United States Army the best I can. So I think Colton, the the person, the brand uh, is, you know, me, the NCO, the senior air commission officer, because I am that 24-7, 365. So there's there's no difference. In your current position, uh, working along, working with the SEAC. Yeah, the SEAC, correct. SEAC, that carries itself in it in and of itself another spotlight. Uh, you are working right there with the senior enlisted advisor to the joint, to the chairman of the, the chair, chairman, chairman of the joint, of the joint chief chiefs of staff. staff. Um, that's your, your three levels removed from the highest power within the DOD, just short of the secretary of defense. Do you feel that? Do you feel the gravity of that? I mean, and, and, and along with everything else, I mean, it just seems like, um, the spotlight and there's several spotlights, and they're all just shining on you right now. Uh, I, I I watch you on Facebook. Um, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I haven't seen your Instagram. I don't know if you do Instagram that much or not. But I, I definitely see you active on Facebook. You're traveling the world. Um, you're doing some amazing things. You are an ambassador. But my question is, what do you consider yourself an ambassador of? So. <sighs> Yes, the, I do feel the pressure of the spotlight. I feel like, uh, not, you know, not only do I have to represent a certain way uh, as, a, as a Christian, as a soldier, as a father, as a husband, I mean, as, let's, as let's, a fighter. Let's be honest. If you screw up, the world is watching. I'm, no, no, I'm not trying to put more, more pressure on you, but yeah. it just seems like like <laughs> the, if, if Colton Smith slips the F-bomb, yeah. there's somebody that's going to be there to go, ooh, you said it especially on social media and then the fight game and then the SEAC position, where, where do you see yourself in that? Yeah. So obviously I got to be very careful with uh, how I carry myself. However, um, especially with, with the SEAC, you know, coming into the position, I was a little intimidated uh, coming in to, to support the SEAC and what he does and his very important mission um, and what he calls irreversible momentum for the enlisted force throughout the DOD and his main mission is to gain the pulse of the force for the chairman of the sec def and to uh, advise them on all matters, all enlisted matters. Um, so traveling the world with him. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew right away that it was going to add another aspect into my life that I had to really, um, my, my PCQs, you know, and, and I couldn't live this, this crazy lifestyle or, or, or anything like that. Like a lot of professional athletes do a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, especially veteran entrepreneurs. I'm still active duty. So, uh, I'm definitely held a different to a, well, I hold myself to a different standard. I shouldn't say I'm held to a different standard than the, the average veteran. I hold myself to a different standard because I know what I'm representing, and I'm representing the office of the SEAC as well, as well as uh, my company and, and fighting and, and being a service member and my family and representing them. Uh, and it's very important for me, um, no matter what duty position I'm in in the military, whether I'm a, a rifle platoon sergeant in, uh, you know, as an infantryman and, and, or a fire team leader back in the day or a squad leader back in the day or a combative instructor or whatever, whatever hat I'm wearing in the military, uh, working for the office of the SEAC, working for the SEAC directly is extremely important to me, extremely important to the, uh, I believe, like I said, the irreversible momentum of the office, of the chair. Once the SEAC retires, Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxel, once he retires, you know, uh, after a, an amazing career, the new SEAC coming in, I believe, is going to need that that momentum to carry him forward. He's only been three SEACs in the armed forces. It's still a relatively unknown position. However, Command Sergeant Major Troxel has been uh, very integral in this position and people are, are recognizing who he is and the voice he has for the enlisted force and uh, showcasing what the enlisted force has done for the military and what he calls 
our country's greatest competitive advantage is our senior non commission or excuse me, our non commission officer corps, our enlisted members. I mean, the backbone where the rubber meets the road, the ones kicking indoors and winning wars. So uh, I think that, you know, it's an yeah. amazing to be there. It's, it's, I've had so many good mentors in my life. I mean, from every aspect of my life. I mean, it's, I'm just, I'm blessed to be where I'm at. The, my coworkers, it's a joint force. So I have joint co joint coworkers there from the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the Navy, the Marines. And just having that even, I mean, just that alone, uh, seeing how they operate and, and what I can take from, from the strategic level and bring it back down to the tactical and operational level, it's invaluable. I mean, it, it makes me excited. I mean, just talking about it, this, it fires me up for when I do go back to the tactical and operational levels. What is on the horizon for Colton Smith? What, what are your goals? My goals? Um, my goals, so be a world champion. It's been, been a goal of mine for a long time. You know, winning the ultimate fighter was huge. I believe it's not close to the potential that I possess in the fight game. This is in no specific order. I mean, because once again, I said fighting is, you know, fourth do, or fifth Do you want to get back list. into the UFC? Is that a goal? Do you, yeah. Does you know, it matter where you it become matter. the world champion? I mean, yeah, it obviously does. I, I don't want to, you know, be the world champion of Uncle Bob's, you know, <laughs> backyard brawl or something, which you see, you know, world championships popping up all the time. Yeah, I'll dominate. I'll be, I'll be the backyard brawl, Bob's backyard brawl world champion. No, um, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to me. It needs to be uh, somewhere that I, that I sh feel we share the same vision. We share the same, uh, I guess, love for the sport not so much of a wwe aspect more of like hey you know your credentials you're fighting you're fighting hard you should you should move up the ranks that way uh so we'll see where that where that goes um now i have goals and ambitions coaching wise too you know coach some world champions jiu-jitsu hopefully and uh continue to coach coach those guys a lot of fighters that are coming up that i'm that i've been coaching and unfortunately a lot of times i gotta say no because i'm traveling for for my job in the military um, and then business wise, you know, I mean, I think our business is just booming and it's, it's, it's been an amazing experience and the way it's going. And I, I just pray that it continues the growth that we've enjoyed. I, I, you know, I hope that grunt style and us continue to grow and continue to partner and, and just we keep learning from them and continue to kind of refine this thing. Cause it is relatively new still, or I mean, five or six years, it's still relatively new. Is there an avenue, is there a market? that you have not gone into that you're interested in? Absolutely. Yes, yeah, there's definitely markets. Uh, everything from even just like straight fitness markets, I, I believe that we have a, a product that um, the messaging of our products definitely could could definitely uh, reach that market, the fitness market. And, and there's some other markets completely 180 of what we're doing now uh, that we are currently kind of in the R&D phase of, and uh, I'm really excited about it. There's a lot of, uh, we have a couple different ideas that we're gonna utilize and, and try to build up. And it's, again, it's not about the monetizing, it's, it's just we're building something that I think that we're giving a product that, that that's unmatched. You know, I feel I feel the product that we're, that we're delivering, the customer service, I mean, every aspect of our business, I feel like we're, we're setting a blueprint for other veterans to follow. It's, it's not about, um, we're taking the whole pie. No, that's not it at all. And I hear that all the time, you know, no, there's, there's so many pieces of the pie left. And unfortunately, I'll be honest, I'll be frank, the, the veteran, the veteran, not just clothing, but the veteran business, businesses in general, it's cutthroat. It is absolutely cutthroat, you yeah. know? Uh, I'd be remiss not to say, you know, one of my biggest competitors, I'll be remiss not to say he's, he's helped me exponentially, and that's Daniel Merritt from Nine Line. I believe his brother actually took over. He's, he has Georgia Land and Cattle he's working on right now. Uh, He's one of our biggest competitors. However, he helped us a lot. Um, he was completely honest with me marketing wise and, and what he did early on to, to, to bolster nine line the way it did. Um, and we took a little, little more of a conservative approach as far as that, but he just, you know, dumped money into it and it worked. And, and he was not scared to tell one of his soon to be competitors that, Hey, this is how I did it. This is why I did it this way. And this is how it worked and why it worked. Um, so other than, you know, him and a few other people, obviously Grunt Style has been phenomenal helping us out and assisting us. Uh, it's a pretty cutthroat market. It's pretty cutthroat. And it's really, it's really unfortunate because <laughs> there is so many pieces of the pie left. I mean, I, I, I love it when I see people, hey, I started a, a t-shirt company. I'm like, well, here's what you need to look out for. You know, I have no qualms about telling somebody, uh, hey, you might not want to do that because of this. Or, you know, we learned this because of this. Why not? You know, we served in the military, um, even, even civilian entrepreneurs. 
if they are willing to learn and listen, I'm going to tell them. It's not trade secrets. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just not. Maybe that's wrong of me. Maybe, you know, Gary Vee and some of these other guys and uh, Tony Robbins would tell me I'm an idiot for, for giving out trade secrets or, or guys off Shark Tank or something. But um, they're not they're not secrets. All right. They're, they're something drop, I can drop, drop one of those quote unquote secrets on us. What's something that and, and again, I, I'm, I, I can guarantee and I can't tell you how many emails I get from veteran apparel, clothing, aspiring entrepreneurs. They email me. They're like, I want to, you know, come on the show and promote my my brand. Um, what is your advice? What's what's a, one of those trade secrets to those people that want to start their apparel company? Um, but looking at the market the way it is, what's your advice to them? I'll, I'll give you a couple Other than things. Don't. Because that's mine. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's it's tough. It's unforgiving. Um, I hope you don't expect to, to take a paycheck. Um, if you are trying to take a paycheck the first month, first year, first two years, um, you're probably in the wrong business. Okay, so first and foremost, you, you got to be completely invested into this um, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially. And I think that, that that's one of the biggest things, biggest takeaways while we are successful because we didn't take a profit. We didn't take a dime out of the company. The company started, I'll be honest, the company started with $1,500 from each of us. And we never put another dime in uh, because we had to. Any money that we put into it, again, was just to bolster our marketing approach or be a little more aggressive with the marketing or the amount of shirts that we got made. Don't go cheap. Um, I know overseas, you go to Pakistan, there's a bunch of places you can get really cheap t-shirts. Don't go cheap, just find a good, solid product. Doesn't have to be a tri-blend right off the bat. Uh, it, it can just be a 100% cotton shirt that, that, that's high quality and don't go cheap. Don't go cheap, you know, and, and don't try to oversaturate your own, your own website, or your own Facebook and your own platform with 100 different designs. Find a design, stick by that design, push that design. That's what we did. We, we started out with one design. It was a Colton Smith shirt. We made 360 of them. They sold like hotcakes and then we made the next design. And we decided how many people were gonna, how many were gonna print at the time. And we printed those and we sold those in the next design. And we had no designs that flopped because I think we were just so zeroed in on quality over quantity of designs. And maybe from a business standpoint, we maybe could have done five designs and made five times the money, or we could have made five designs and went five times bankrupt. So um, pretty basic. I know it seems kind of trivial and minuscule as far as uh, giving you tips, but. Literally, those tips is, is, good tip. is what built our company. I mean, that, that's literally why we're sitting where we are today is because we had a blueprint that we believed was going to work. We stuck by that blueprint. We listened to people around us. Some of it, we took it for a grain of salt and, and didn't utilize. Um, but we figured out what, what's going to work for us and our vision, and it worked. And, it, and it's working now. And again, it could end tomorrow, and I could not be upset. I see a lot of veteran apparel companies. I see a lot of vet, of veteran companies in general um, trying to push like bikinis and guns and shooting and drinking and um, a lot of flashy uh, in your face, even very aggressive, kind of like I'm a veteran in your face. This is what I do. I'm screaming at my phone inside of a car about, you know, some political issue. Um, I don't see that coming from Enlisted Nine. Yeah, no. Um, a lot of a lot of what we put, what we push, and content we push. We, we, you know, we were careful for a long time because we were both active duty service members at the time, and and uh, we obviously we needed to make sure that the the you know all of our everything we do fell in line with the Army values. I mean, bottom line, I mean that, that's a great business model to think about the Army values and, and how you run your business and and how you can incorporate something uh, a set of values. It's not to be the Army values, but a set of values, a set of standards, and to incorporate it into your business and, and never falter from that. And I feel like we've continued to do that. I feel like, yes, we'll post some stuff on some uh, controversial stuff on Facebook uh, to get debate, healthy debate. Um, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green Party, whatever you are. Um, yes, uh, I'm a conservative and I'll, I'll admit that, but I have no problem talking to somebody or debating somebody uh, who has an opposing view and maybe they'll change my mind. Maybe I'll change their mind. doesn't matter. That's not what it's about. It's more about the freedoms we possess in this country, being patriotic and being able to express that through clothing or through a post or through uh, engaging in dialogue online and having that platform to do so on our website without getting attacked by, you know, the admins or, 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 or you know, any of the members of our, of our Facebook page or Twitter, or Instagrams or anything like that. So I think it's very important for us is 
I don't care what, what, what race, creed, religion you are, you know, if you are a, a freedom loving American that wants to wear, uh, our apparel or you're a Canadian or you're a Brit, it doesn't matter what you are. If you want to wear our apparel and you want to express yourself in a, in a way, um, that's not going to demean the United States and, and what we, what we stand for, then I'm all about it. All right, let's wrap this up. Colin. I want to get you out of here back home to your family. Uh, if we want to learn more about Enlisted 9 and we want to hear more about you, where do we go? Yeah, so Enlisted 9 Fight Company on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Check us out. Uh, Colton Smith MMA on Twitter. Uh, I don't have an Instagram personally, but I got a business Instagram, Enlisted 9 Fight Company. And then uh, on, on Facebook, Colton Smith MMA. Got my private page as well. If you have any questions, guys, I mean it. Hit me up, email me, and I, I'm more than more than happy to help people. I, I, I don't care. If it goes to my spam box, I'll try to dig in there on desktop and figure that out. Uh, but thank you guys so much, and God bless all you. I want to thank you again for taking uh, time out of your extremely busy schedule. I have no doubt you're uh, probably going to go back home, pack up a bag, and be right out the door again, uh, which is great. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Colton Smith. Thanks again, man. Thanks, brother. All right, that was Colton Smith, one of the nicest guys on the planet, despite his ability to ragdoll me and turn me into a human pretzel. This was our second go at an interview. The first was in Afghanistan, but that computer with our interview died a horrible death. So a year and some change later, here we are. We made it happen again. Colton Smith, thank you for uh, just being as generous as you are with your time. Folks, don't forget to like, listen, subscribe, and share this podcast. Want to help us out even more? Leave a short review on iTunes for us, the After Action Review. That review goes a long way for us. Don't forget about our amazing sponsors and uh, affiliates. Uh, Seabag Locker Coffee. Roast your cup in as little as four days. Seabaglocker.com. Use promo code AAR. Get 10% off your purchase. The Java Can, a rugged ice coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so that you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere life takes you. The Javacan.com. Use promo code AAR. Get 10% off that purchase. Live life charged. And on its off brain, clinically proven to enhance memory, attention, and focus, go to ONNIT.com. Use promo code AAR. Get 10% off your purchase. That's Oh, and NIT.com. Folks, that does it for episode 50. I I think that was great. I, I really enjoyed talking to Colton. Uh, I think we, we hit 50 on a high note. Now, 51, 52, 60, 70, 80, 90. Guys, ladies, vets, civvies, we are going to get amazing more amazing it's going to get out of control i'm telling you uh i've got plans for this show big plans coming up startup school capital post bunker labs shout out bunker labs dc um guys a lot of stuff is happening a lot of cool stuff on the horizon i've got some great guests already lined up what do you want for 100 what do you want for episode 100 because it's coming now i know that other shows are already in their 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s you know episodes um, the show is a little slower. I think we do two episodes a month, two or three sometimes. I don't think anything's wrong with that. I kind of like that. Nice and slow. Uh, we take an hour. We take our time. And I hope it reflects in the quality of the show that you're getting. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's – hope that all – I hope you guys are enjoying the format. And here's the thing. This is an open discussion, folks. Open discussion. I want your feedback. Hit me up. You can always reach me at Rod Rodriguez at the AAR podcast.com. That's my email address. Or you can leave a review. Tell me what you think about the show. How can we make improvements? What do you want to hear? And how can I make it better? This is all about you. So, yeah, that's that does it. Episode 50. Um, I will see you at the next episode. Thank you.